My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is part two and the conclusion of this little short study. And I hope that this has brought a blessing. It has been a very interesting study for me and I have learned quite a bit from comparing the scriptures and some of the things that was shown on uh, by looking it up on uh, that eSword program. It's amazing all the different scriptures that are right there on that little side task that point out so many of all the, the different scriptures that all connect to what is being said. But anyway, I I digress in a few places in the, the other part of this video and I apologize but uh, I guess I just you know when I feel led to, to discuss things then there it is so uh, please overlook some of the changes in topics and uh, but uh, I hope that whatever is spoken I hope that it uh, helps bring some kind of blessing or some form of discernment to someone else so anyway with that said let's get into this study and I'm going to start off with a little Google search that I did it, it was pretty amazing so here we go so was Jesus Christ forsaken by God question I decided to go just kind of take a little look and it's amazing we have four million 290 results of this very question so we have four million people out there that have asked this and it would definitely take way too much time to try to sort through all of them, all of them and, uh, and all their various answers and, and what have you. When we research this, our Lord Jesus Christ gives it to us. It's right there in the scriptures. So um, rather than try to go through each of these four million inquiries, uh, let's just go look at the word and discover for our own selves exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ was saying when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this way we can dispel any misunderstandings or we can rebuke any naysayers or people who do not understand this and uh, there won't be no question in our minds what our Lord Jesus Christ was doing on the cross when he said these things verse 18 they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture Let's go take a look at... So this is an excellent movie it's showing so much of of what is recorded and documented the Romans are here they're gambling for his clothing so uh, okay so now we can go back to Psalms 22 verse 19 but be not thou far from me O Lord O my strength haste thee to help me verse 20 Deliver my soul from the sword, my soul from the power of the dog. It calls it darling, but it's um, translate to be soul. Verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the wild ox. Do not believe there's any such thing as a unicorn. It goes back in the Hebrew, it translates to be wild ox. Verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Verse 23, ye that fear the Lord, praise
praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. Verse 24. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Verse 25. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him or revere him. Verse 26. The meek or the humble shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Verse 29. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. Verse 30. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. And what seed is this? This is God's elect. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he has done this, or the remnant, I should say. But, um, but see, this, this word, his actions on the cross has been handed down from generation to generation. And they shall come and they shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. And you just think about all the different generations that's been born since this event, this gift was given to us on the cross. And in addition, Psalms 23 follows 22. And this is such an important chapter. It's short, but... Our Heavenly Father gave us this chapter right after Psalms 22. A Psalm of David, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And we're going to pop over to Luke twenty four forty four. And Jesus said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And I would also like to add, isn't it amazing? I don't know how many of you have heard this, but uh, been out of church and have them tell you that the Old Testament is just history. It, it, it's the Old Covenant. It's not important to the Gospels. And yet, right here, from Christ's own mouth, he tells us that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He's fulfilled quite a bit of scripture, but he still has the return, the gathering, and that's yet to come. So that follows in Revelation. So this tells us, or it should tell us, that the Old Testament is every bit as important as it was during the time that Christ was teaching the Old Testament. The covenant is the same. 
the word is the same. It's the same message from the beginning all the way to the end. And we need to know Revelation. So if you're in a church that tells you not to study Revelation, that you're not going to be here, they're deceiving you. Because Revelation means to reveal. That's what the word means. It's revealing. It reveals what's coming. And it tells us that the false Christ comes first. And he's coming to deceive the world. Um, the point is, will you be deceived? Have you studied God's word? Are you prepared for what he's going to be doing? What uh, Do you know that he comes in peace? Prosperity. He, uh, he's going to be performing supernatural miracles before the eyes of men. He's going to stand in the holy place, uh, claiming he's the Messiah, claiming he's God, claiming he's an angel of light, and he's disguised, and he is Satan, the Antichrist. So just be watchful of these kind of things, uh, because I know I have been in several different churches, and these are some of the things that they've taught or things that they've said. So get into a good King James Standard Version Bible and a Strong's Concordance and start studying the word for yourself because the, the doctrine of the Pharisees is with us today it is in the churches that are out there right now and not just in the Christian community uh, you, you're looking at Islam uh, the Hindus I mean it just Taoism it, uh, Buddhism it's all it's in all of them the leaven of the Pharisees means their doctrines. It's that particular religion's doctrines. That's what it talks about. That's what Christ warned us about. So be watchful of these things. So we can look at this over here. And we have all these scriptures right here. And Christ is talking. He totally foretold what they would do to him. And, on you know, uh, that he was going to be crucified. He was not forsaken. He knew what was coming, and yet he still went. Luke 18, 32, For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, or the heathen, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spit on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. Christ, you know, he was talking about what was written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. He's telling them in Matthew 17, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. So, I mean, uh, anyone that doesn't understand that our Heavenly Father did not forsake him. This was part, this is prophecy. He came and fulfilled the scriptures. He came in the volume of the book. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. And I just wanted to point out, over here on this little side, task um in the law it goes back to genesis three fifteen, and i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel this goes back to those kenites the sons of satan the sons of cain uh, the woman's seed is the bloodline from Adam, Eve, and Seth. Because Cain murdered Abel. Cain is the son of Satan. So, it goes back to the Garden of Eden. And then we have, in Genesis 14, 18, we have Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of peace. It's what Salem means. Brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. So this is to Abraham. So before Abraham was, I am. In case you don't understand those scriptures. I believe that's in the book of John. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. 
This is to Abraham. It's in Genesis 22, 18. In Genesis 49, 10, it states, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, what is this talking about? This is um, very simple when you understand the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. We find that in Luke 3. His genealogy, which is Mary's genealogy, it goes all the way back to King David, and it's through his son Nathan. This scepter that is being spoken of and the gathering is unto our Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. And that's at that seventh trump. That is found in Revelation 11. That's when this gathering shall be. So that scepter passed from King David through his son Nathan all the way down unto Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is also... Of the Levitical priesthood through Aaron and we find that documented in Luke 1 Elizabeth was of the Levitical priesthood she was perfect her and Zechariah here in Hebrews 7 it documents for this Melchizedek king of Salem priest of the Most High God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. This is talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. So Melchizedek is, Melka is king. Zadok is of the righteous or the just. So that makes him king of kings and lord of lords. This is who Melchizedek is, is Jesus Christ. He is our high priest. We do not need to go bow down to some man and confess our sins to this man because of the corruption in the world. This, our, our Heavenly Father saw the corruption in the world. He did away with that. He, he uh, rent the, the veil, the temple. The veil is the flesh of Christ, is what that represents. So that veil was rent. So we can walk right in and speak to our Heavenly Father at any place, any time. We, you know, we can talk to our Heavenly Father wherever we are. You know, we have um, Islam, and they keep talking about their prophet Muhammad. I think they're so very confused because... I don't see anything written about Muhammad, but it clearly states in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ would be that prophet. And we are told, like here in Acts 3.23, And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, Jesus Christ, shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and the, those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. So when you understand that our Lord Jesus Christ called himself a prophet, he was referred to as a prophet in many places in the New Testament as well as the Old. He is that prophet. He is the only begotten son of our Heavenly Father. And he came because there's no way man in the flesh can be can can do it right. We all make mistakes. We have weakness. We are weak in the flesh. Only Christ was perfect. Only he was without sin. Only he could go on that cross and redeem us. And it was his stripes and his blood that gave us that opportunity to believe in our Heavenly Father, to redeem us from our sins. And, you know, there it is. And he's coming back at that seventh trump. He's not, there's no pre-flight out of here. It's at that seventh trump. Anything that comes claiming to be Messiah, the prophet, uh, God, what have you, is going to be the false one. 
it's going to be Satan disguised as Christ. It's going to be Satan disguised as the prophet. It's going to be Satan disguised as the Messiah. And he's going to stand in the holy place. We learn this in 2 Thessalonians 2. And then we find in Revelation 13, these are the things he's going to be doing in order to deceive the world. He will unify the whole world under his banner of his one world government, his one world peace and safety and wealth and what have you. That's what he's going to do. And he's going to stand in Jerusalem. We have the two witnesses that shall precede him. We find that out in Revelation 11. All these things shall be. It will come to pass just as it is written. So just be watchful. You know, read Revelation 11 to find out what's going to be happening. Uh, I mean, we know exactly on that third and a half day after the two witnesses, after Satan steps over the bounds and he kills God's anointed, then on that third and a half day, that's when our Lord, our true Lord Jesus Christ will return and he will call them up. And they'll be dead in the street and, he, and they will be raised just as he had been raised from the tomb. So those are our examples. Those are our signs. Be watchful. In Luke 24, 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Verse 46, and he said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Verse 48, and ye are witnesses of these things. Verse 49, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. See, he says, my Father. It doesn't say my God. He says, my Father. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with the power from on high. He's talking about Holy Spirit, uh, as we find in Acts 2. I believe that we can conclude this study on what exactly our Lord Jesus Christ was referring to when he stated, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it is, should be pretty well established that our Heavenly Father did not forsake our Lord Jesus Christ while he was on the cross. He was uh, obviously teaching us about the scriptures that had prophesied these events that would happen, that would lead to that moment in time. I would recommend that you go and research the Law of Moses. And we have found in Isaiah that that was one of the prophets that talked about this. And we also found in Psalms that King David was also a prophet. So anyway, I hope that this has helped to better determine uh, the meaning of, these, of that scripture. And I know it's helped me. I have learned quite a bit doing this study so anyway god bless everyone and take care